All right, here we are. First and second Thessalonians, preparing for the second coming. This is lesson number, lesson number three. And uh, this lesson entitled, Credentials for the True Ministers. So uh, let's uh, do a little review of what we've covered so far in this series on uh, the books of, or the two letters of uh, Thessalonians. First of all, Paul is writing to this young church that he has established in the city of Thessalonica. And in the opening of his letter, he rejoices over the fact that he considers them to be true converts. A way of compliment, imagine a way of complimenting them. He says, I believe and I rejoice in the fact that you people are true Christians, you're true converts. And then he gives several reasons why he, uh, why he rejoices. First of all, because he was a true apostle, preaching the pure gospel and doing it in love and sincerity. So they, they got the good news from the right person. They were converted in the right way by people who knew the gospel and who were preaching it in the correct way. So he rejoices because of that fact. Secondly, he rejoices in his prayer because their response to the gospel was sincere. And I, and I su suspect that that was probably a a more important idea, their belief was sincere, their change, the change in their life was real once they were converted, and then their perseverance became an inspiration to other people because uh, they were converted to Christianity, but they suffered a lot of persecution, a lot of trouble in the church, so on and so forth, but they were hanging in there and their attitude was encouraging other congregations to do the same. So in the next couple of chapters, Paul will review his time with them and he's going to defend his ministry among them. Now there's no mention of it directly, but by the nature of Paul's response, it seems that Paul had come under attack being charged with the accusation of acting like a charlatan, a fake. Uh, you have to kind of read between the lines. You know, a lot of times in in these epistles, they answer questions or problems. They don't give what the original problem was. All you see is what the answer is. So you have to kind of surmise what the question was or what the problem was. Well, at that time, um, there were wandering preachers and, and circuit philosophers, if you wish, that were kind of going around from place to place. And uh, they taught and spread various ideas, various new philosophies. And they did this in exchange for money and for prestige. So it was, uh, it was something in that culture. You know, they didn't have TV, obviously, that type of thing. So part of, I wouldn't say the entertainment, but part of the exercise of their culture was listening to these various philosophers and teachers that would come to their towns and to their town halls from time to time, you know, proposing new ideas and new philosophies. So they were, there were people in Thessalonica <clears throat> excuse me, who were accusing Paul of being one of these guys, just going around and you know, preaching for money, just saying anything to uh, get money and, and prestige. So in the next section, Paul is going to lay down the credentials that all should look for in one who is a true minister of the word of God, whether he be an apostle or an evangelist or a, or a teacher. So this is his his defense. So the first thing that he says is that true ministers trust in God. Chapter two. So that's where we need to be. Chapter two. Let's put that up there and read those verses. He says, for you yourselves know, brethren, that our coming to you was not in vain. But after we had already suffered and been mistreated in Philippi, as you know, we had the boldness in our God to speak to you the gospel of God amid much, uh, much opposition. So Paul's rescue from prison in Philippi, his coming to Macedonia, his trials and opposition by the Jews, all of these events um, were sustained and accomplished because he trusted in God. He's saying, you know, I'm a true minister because I trust in God, first and foremost. When you examine Paul's experiences, you see that the only way he could have survived was through the Lord. I mean, we know that obviously because we're reading, you know, we've read through a lot of the epistles, the book of Acts. You know. We see that Paul trusted God to rescue him from jail when the situation was hopeless. 
He trusted God for the opportunities to make contacts and preach because he was helpless to make these things happen. You know, there was still no door knocking or there was nothing like that going on. No, imagine going to a city where there's no church. Your job's to establish a church and there's no church there. You know, usually there's a church and then that church will send out some people you know, from that group and it'll set up a church over here on the other side of town. But imagine there's no church. There's no door knocking, there's none of that. How do you, where do you start? How do you do this? No one's ever done it. And so Paul is saying, you know, I trusted God to give me the opportunity to preach, to find the people that, that I would preach to. He also trusted God to give him direction for his ministry at a time that he was directionless, because he wanted to go to Asia. He figured, yeah, go to Asia. And we read the last week that you know, the Spirit prevented him. He couldn't do what he wanted to do. And so you know, he, he had the, what's called the Macedonian call. He had a vision that someone was calling him. Well, who's giving him that direction? Well, it wasn't his own brain. You know, God was telling him, I don't want you to go there. I want you to go this way. You know, not right, left. And of course, he trusted God to save him from his attackers when he was defenseless. Again, no, uh, no the, the laws there were not really designed to protect the individual. The laws were there to protect the Roman you know, Empire. And so he could be beaten up and so on and so forth. He had, no, he had no recourse. So he's saying true leaders in ministry are not such simply because they're good speakers or debaters or organizers. I mean, that's helpful, obviously. Those are good skills to have. But first and foremost, they're qualified to lead in ministry if they can demonstrate their abiding trust in God. That's the number one thing. Why? Because that's the number one thing you're going to teach a convert. It's, it's the number one objective of teaching those who are already Christians to trust in God day after day. So Paul demonstrated this trust when he continued to preach and teach despite the discouragement and the opposition that he faced in and out of the church, because it would have been so easy to quit. Think about that for a second. I've seen people in this congregation, no names, but in this congregation, I've seen people quit the church because they had a little, you know, a little bumper thing with another member, a little cross miscommunication about something, whatever, and they quit the church. Or they asked God for something and God didn't give them that thing and they, you know, they got tired of asking, so they said, I'll punish you, God. I'm going to quit the church. And when you read Paul's life, you know, he was beaten, whipped, put in jail, you know, <laughs> laughed at, scorned, undermined by his own people. I mean, it, it, it took a tremendous amount of faith in God to just keep on going after. It's one thing when somebody outside the church hurts you. You, know, you can almost understand that. Well, they don't get it. They don't believe in God. They, they have not made a commitment to Christ. You know, if they say nasty things or if they kind of laugh at my faith or if they just dismiss me, you know, okay, I get it. You know? But when somebody in the church does that to you, that hurts very, very deeply. And so, you know, Paul is saying that true leaders, you know, uh, true leaders hang in there despite the opposition. True leaders demonstrate this quality in the same way in today's church. Boy, the last thing you want is an elder uh, you know, who quits because somebody said something, you know, somebody criticized their leadership. Can you imagine? If elders quit because somebody criticized their leadership, we wouldn't have any elders. I mean, they wouldn't, you know, we'd be going through them. You know, <laughs> every month we'd have some new ones. Because in every organization, who is it that we criticize? Well, we don't criticize the people below us. We always criticize the people above us, right? Same thing in the church, same thing for, for leaders. Have to have a bit of a, of a, of a thick skin. The second credential of true leadership that he talks about is that true ministers, if you wish, are sincere. And in this section, Paul compares two sets of characteristics for judging ministers, preachers, leaders uh, that he has seen in the leadership and the false leadership that has uh, kind of crept into the uh, Thessalonian church. So first of all, he looks at the worldly characteristics 
of worldly leaders. Uh, we read, he says, for our exhortation does not come from error or impurity or by way of deceit, but just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God who examines the hearts. For we never came with flattering speech, as you know, nor with a pretext for greed, God is witness, nor did we seek glory from men, either from you or from others, even though as apostles of Christ we might have asserted our authority. So you notice the words there that describe the uh, worldly characteristics of some of the leaders that were there. First one he says, error. Not an honest mistake or a misunderstanding, but rather error that comes from an evil mind. In other words, the teaching of error because you know, you know it's not the right thing, but you're doing it because of false motives, greed or whatever. Then he mentions impurity, and that's sexual impurity. Isn't it sad? I mean, I read, I've, I read in the, the, the Oklahoman uh, just this week that two very high profile religious leaders were caught, one, uh, and again, no, no names or anything like that here, no use to increase the embarrassment, but you know what I'm talking about. One individual, very highly placed individual, representative of a, of a large uh, you know, Christian organization, was caught stealing um, uh, prescription drugs in the home of one of, his, uh, one of his friends. Imagine that, and we're not talking about a kid here, this is a you know, grown adult man who'd been head of a religious organization for many, many years. And then another individual, again, who was uh, 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 caught and indicted for uh, sexual misbehavior. You know, if, if these two guys you know, were plumbers, no, no, no insult to those who work in the plumbing industry here, but if they were plumbers, it would not have even made the newspaper, right? It would, not have, it would have not even made page 20 in the newspapers. But because these two individuals were religious leaders, it made the front page. And, and, and the Daily Oklahoman really loves to put the mug shot. You know, they really love to put the person's mug. Let's go for maximum personal destruction and, and embarrassment. You know what I'm saying? So Paul is saying, you know, our motives were not sexual impu impurity. He mentions the word deceit planned lies and dishonesty, and popularity. All this in the passage I just read. We didn't do this to be popular, he says, trying to gain approval by telling people what they want to hear. Or oh, does, does that sound familiar? The closer we get to get a voting day, you know, everybody's telling us what we want to hear, or trying to figure out what we want to hear. What do you think those polls are for? Those polls are there to, to find out what do people want to hear? so that the politicians, unfortunately, many times will just tell us what we want to hear. Paul says that's not, a religious leader in the church is not telling you what you want to hear. Uh, flattery, done in order to blind them, not to build them up. It's one thing to build somebody up by pointing out their good points and encouraging them. It's quite another thing simply to flatter someone in order to gain an advantage. False pretenses, any type of covering to hide greed, and then he mentions personal glory at the end, trying to raise ourselves up above, of other, above others. Paul said this, these things are not the characteristics of, the, of God's ministers. Paul suggests that these are reasons some people go into religious service or what they hide under the cover of ministry, but these are not the things that should be part of a true minister's life. So then he goes on and he mentions uh, spiritual characteristics. He says, but we prove to be gentle among you as a nursing mother tenderly cares for her own children. Having so fond an affection for you, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives, because you had become very dear to us. For you recall, brethren, our labor and hardship, how working night and day so as not to be a burden to any of you, we proclaim to you the gospel of God. You are witnesses, and so is God, how devoutly and uprightly and blamelessly we behave toward you believers. Just as you know how we were exhorting and encouraging and imploring each one of you as a father would his own children. 
so that you would walk in a manner worthy of the God who calls you into His own kingdom and glory. So now compare the words in, in those verses that he talks about uh, as he talks about themselves, him and his, his, um, uh, his, uh, uh, the other workers that were with him. Gentle, and he, he says, we were gentle with you. And he uses the image of a nursing mother. Anything more gentle than that? A nursing mother with her baby? Self-sacrificing. You know, they gave of themselves, not just, they didn't just teach the doctrine, they gave of themselves. They risked their lives to preach to them. They gave their hearts as well as their message. What does that mean? They were involved with the people. You know, they were involved with the people. Very, very important. They were hard working. They worked night and day among them and they took no money. And he says, and it was our right to take money. The worker is worthy of his hire. There's nothing wrong with the minister earning his living from preaching the word. But he says, we had that right, but we didn't take that right. He says, we worked for free among you because the church at Thessalonica was a young church and they were poor people. So they didn't want to take advantage of of, of their right to be paid for their, for their work. Isn't that what we do when we send a missionary somewhere? Isn't that what we do with Jeffrey Karima, for example, who works in, in Kenya, in the Maru province? We support him fully, why? Because he doesn't have to take any money from the six or seven small churches that he services. You know, he's a circuit preacher, he, he preaches at six or seven different churches, sometimes two or three in one day. And then during the week he teaches at the Bible college there, you know, training young preachers. But he doesn't take a dime from the Bible college and he doesn't take a penny from any of these churches. Why? Because they're young. He's just planted them. He does not want anyone to accuse him of simply you know, doing this for the money. And that's, I'm not saying we're special in that. Most churches of Christ, that's pretty much how we operate. We send a missionary out, we pay their salary so they won't have to collect any money from these young churches, give them a chance to grow and to, and to mature. He says they were pure, their conduct was above reproach. There was no hint of evil, no hint of worldliness. And they were fervent. They wanted the Thessalonians to please God and have eternal life with all their hearts, with all their strength. This was their motive in ministry, the good of the church. They wanted the church to, to grow. So Paul reminds them about their experience with himself and Silas and Timothy, and he challenges them to judge them not only on what they said and taught, but also on their actions, because we have enough talkers, don't we, in our society? Do we not have enough talkers on TV, online, on Facebook? That's all people do is talk. Talk, 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 talk. And Paul says, we didn't just talk. You know, we, we talked the talk, but we also walked the talk. You know? He's saying, please, if you're going to judge us, judge us on our actions, not just on our, not just on our words. Now, some say that it's not Christian to judge, but Paul says that the church can and should examine itself and its leaders to see if what they say is from God and if what they do is godly. Absolutely. Well, you want to destroy a church? If you want to destroy a church, all you have to do is destroy its leadership. You, know, you could have a thousand member church and you, let's say five elders. You, know. you destroy those five elders in some way, you'll destroy that church. And I've seen it happen over and over and over again. You know, two of the elders get into fighting with each other for over something and you see the split in the church. Very discouraging to see elders fight. That's why in this congregation we're so so blessed that we've had such a long life in this congregation with no, no division, no major division. Not saying there's no disagreements, there's plenty of disagreements about things and how to do things and so on and so forth, but there's never been division. Our elders, our leaders, ministers, so on and so forth, always found a way to make things work you know, in, a, in a spirit of, of, uh, of uh, unity. So, we have to remember there's a big difference between criticizing and complaining because things are not like we want them and making a sober judgment on the accuracy and the conduct of our leaders and ourselves. Not the same thing. And we have to be careful. So Paul is saying true ministers of the gospel need to demonstrate good things in order to accomplish good things. 
if the inside is good, it'll show itself on the outside eventually. So true ministers trust God, they demonstrate good spiritual fruit, and then he says, true ministers get results. Verse 13, he says, for this reason we also constantly thank God that when you received the word of God which you heard from us, you accepted it, not as the word of men, but for what it really is, the word of God, which also performs its work in, in you who believe. For you, brethren, became imitators of the churches of God in Christ Jesus that are in Judea. For you also endured the same sufferings at the hands of your own countrymen, even as they did uh, from the Jews, who both killed the Lord Jesus and the prophets and drove us out. They are not pleasing to God, but hostile to all men, hindering us from speaking to the Gentiles so that they may be saved with the result that they always fill up the measure of their sins, but wrath has come upon them to the utmost. So true ministers get results. And notice here he's not talking about numbers. We don't know how big the church was in Thessalonica, and that's not always the best rule of measurement. I always say, if, if, if big is the way that we decide who's right, then the communist Chinese are right. And we all should be atheists and communists because that's, that's the biggest group, right? So we can't judge by, by size, all right? We, we don't know how big Thessalonica was. We do know, however, that despite the opposition and the difficult circumstances they faced and the short period of teaching they had, there was a radical change among them. That's how you measure growth. This change occurred because godly men preached God's message accurately and they did it in a godly way. So we know that growth doesn't always come right away, but if the other elements are in place, it does come, absolutely. True ministers don't blame the church for lack of growth. They ask God to change them first so their impact can have a positive effect for growth. You know, again, something else I've, I've always talked about as far as leadership is concerned, that the church cannot grow beyond its leadership. And I'm not just talking about the church, I'm talking about any organization. No organization can grow, you know what I'm saying, mature, develop beyond its own leadership. If its leadership goes this high, the organization can't go any higher than its leadership because once it gets to the level of its leadership, if the leadership doesn't move ahead, then there begins to be tension and, and so on and so forth. Very important idea. You know, what did Jesus say? A disciple is not above his teacher, nor a slave above his master. But it's enough for the disciple that he becomes as his teacher, right? So you know, the, 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 the group is following the leadership and growing to the level of leadership, but the thing in this equation is that so is the leadership growing. They're following each other. You know, leaders are, 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 are casting a vision, they're taking steps forward, they're moving forward. And that's very important in any organization, including the church. So true ministers, he says, they get results. Why? Because they continue to motivate the group with the word of God and they themselves are changing and growing. All right, another thing he says, true ministers love the church. Love the church. He says, but we brethren, having been taken away from you for a short while in person, not in spirit, we're all the more eager with great desire to see your face, for we wanted to come to you. I, Paul, more than once, and yet Satan hindered us. For who is our hope or joy or crown of exultation? Is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus at His coming? For you are our glory and joy. Therefore, when we could endure it no longer, we thought it best to be left behind at Athens alone, and we sent Timothy, our brother and God's fellow worker in the gospel of Christ, to strengthen and encourage you as to your faith, so that no one would be disturbed by these afflictions, for you yourselves know that we have been destined for this. For indeed, when we were with you, we kept telling you in advance that we were going to suffer affliction, and so it came to pass, as you know. For this reason, when I could endure it no longer, I also sent to find out about your faith, for fear that the tempter might have tempted you, and our labor would be in vain. 
but now that Timothy has come to us from you and has brought us good news of your faith and love and that you always think kindly of us, longing to see us just as we also long to see you. For this reason, brethren, in all our distress and affliction, we were comforted about uh, you through your faith. For now we really live if you stand firm in the Lord. For what thanks can we render to God for you in return for all the joy with which we rejoice before our God on your account? As we night and day keep praying most earnestly that we may see your face and may complete what is lacking in your faith. Now may God and the Father Himself and Jesus our Lord direct your way to you, our way to you. And may the Lord cause you to increase and abound in love for one another and for all people just as we also do for you so that He may establish your hearts without blame in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all His saints. Long passage, but it's a passage of an expression of love from, from Paul. Note Paul's attitude toward them. He was eager to see them, verse 17. They are his glory and joy, verse 20. He needed to know of their condition, verse five in the next uh, chapter. His emotional life was tied to theirs, verse eight. He prayed for them night and day, verse 10. He wanted only the best for them, verses 11 to 13. Uh, what does that say about Paul and his relationship to these people? Was he just casually involved with them? Were they just, well, just another convert, just another church? No, he really felt for these people, really felt for these people. Paul loves these brethren because they're the precious fruit of his work in the Lord. It was his love of Christ that motivated him to go to them at first, but now it's his love of them that causes his joy and continued efforts among them. You know, preachers are motivated by the growth of the church, numerically but also individually. Every time a brother or sister comes to me and says, you know what, I was thinking I got this extra time and this and that and I noticed that over in this area there's, you know, we've been looking for a volunteer for a long time and what do you say, do you think I could volunteer and do that work? I mean, there's my paycheck. That's my paycheck, that, there's my spiritual paycheck right there. Obviously I got a paycheck because I got to pay rent just like you folks. But my real paycheck, the real satisfaction comes when that happens or when I hear the youth group wants to get together and go do a project to help people. There's my paycheck. When we say to the church, you know, we, we, we want to make this objective here because we want to do such and such financially and, the, and the, the offering comes in, bing, bang, bing, bang, you know, and everybody pulls together and we do it. There's my paycheck. Paul loved the brethren and there was nothing he loved more than seeing them grow in their faith. You know, there was a young man, and this is a true story, there was a young guy who wanted to go into mission work. And he asked me what he needed in order to succeed in this type of, uh, in this type of work. And he said, you know, uh, I speak one language and I'm kind of learning another language. And uh, should I get a trade or a second income you know, to fall back on if things get tough out in the mission field? Uh, uh, obviously I need to know about different religions. Uh, I need to get a good support network you know, and all this stuff. And he was rattling off, you know, what am I missing? He said, because you've been out in the field, you've been a missionary. And I told him that all these things were necessary and basic, but the most important thing you need is the love for the people that you're trying to convert. You have to love the people that you're trying to convert. You have to have a burden for them. You see, it's the love for the church that will get you through the difficult moments when the church disappoints you, when people in the church speak against you, uh, even when after all the work that you've put in, perhaps in counseling and teaching, you know, some individuals, so on and so forth, and doing great, and then all of a sudden they just quit and go back into the world. Those moments are very difficult. Very, very difficult. People that you've You've, you've done the premarital counseling, you've done the, you've done the wedding, you've encouraged them, you've, you know, so on and so forth, and you know, seven years down the line, the marriage just blows up, boom, and they're gone. They, they can't even speak to each other anymore. 
and they don't want any counseling, and they don't, they don't want to hear it from anybody. Obviously the pain is greater for the children involved than the family, of course. But even, even the ministers and the elders that kind of worked with that couple, they, the fallout, you know, the, the, the shrapnel hits them too. The shrapnel hits them too. Sometimes when I hear about that in the church, I go back, you know, I've kept every file on every wedding I've ever done. I've kept the sermon and the vows written out. And when that happens in this congregation, I go back to my file and I go through and I pull out that five-year-old, 10-year-old file and I look at the vows that those people made to each other. Because when I do a wedding, I tell the couple, I always give them a copy of what we've done, a copy of my sermon that I did at the wedding and also you know, the vows that they exchanged, and I, everything, everything's typed out and I give them a copy to keep with their marriage license. And I tell them every year, I want you to, on your anniversary, make it a ritual, you pull out that wedding thing and you look at those vows and you read them to each other and see how well you're doing in keeping those vows. I promise to love you and support you and I, whatever. They're not always the same. Some people put in different things. Read those things every year and ask yourself, how are we doing with this? And if you're Christians, obviously, do we need to pray a little bit about, you know, oh. so it's the, it's the same thing you know, in, in the church. Only the sincere love of souls that you are reaching out to will keep you in the ministry long after the newness and the excitement wear off. These new guys that come out of college, they got their degree, they got their first job, they're excited in ministry. Oh boy, I'm a minister, I'm a youth minister, I'm a this, I'm a that, you know, and they just can't wait to get in there. You know? But give them 10 years. <laughs> The shine comes off a bit. Well, and it comes off, why? Because everybody's crisis becomes your crisis. Every death in the family that they suffer that one time, you suffer every time, every single time. You know how many funerals I've done? You know how many people that I've watched die? So you, know, you better be loving the church because you can't, you can't do that for 20, 30, 40 years as a minister, an elder, whatever, you can't be doing that if you, don't, if you don't love the people that you're with. Training and support, they'll start you in ministry, but only an abiding love for souls will keep you in ministry long after the excitement and the newness wears off. So in this section here, we, we have seen Paul defending his ministry among them against the charge that he was some sort of religious fake, uh, an opportunist you know, of some kind. And in his defense, he describes the characteristics of those who are religious charlatans and fakes. And alongside these, he lays down four main characteristics to look for in a true minister of God. One, true ministers love God, trust God completely. Two, true ministers practice what they preach and it's evident. Three, true ministers get results. And they do this because they bring the power from God to get results, which is the gospel. Not organizational skills or you know, speaking skills. They bring the gospel. They're preaching the true gospel over and over again to that, to that particular group. And finally, they love the church. They, their love is evident by what they sacrifice to serve it. Now there are a lot who at some point think they want to become ministers, teachers, elders, so on and so forth. And these people need to ask themselves what God desires from His ministers. Not just degrees, not just work methods, equipment, money, so on and so forth. God wants trust. He wants trust, purity, and devotion to the church that His Son died to create. So I think you know, in, in any leadership role in the church, you know, I'm not just talking about ministers and elders, but those who want to serve as deacons or you know, leaders in a, you know, in a certain area of ministry, even without the title, people are leading in ministry. So these kind of qualities of heart, these are the things that give light to the studies and direction to the methods of work and the results of our effort when we're leading in any area uh, of the church. OK, so we're going to quit now because he begin, Paul begins to talk about another subject and I won't broach that till we get to the, 
next lesson. All right, thank you very much. We're good.